Uh, is this on? Yes. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about um, completely log concave polynomials, which are uh, um, some of which ex uh, appeared in, in Nima's talk. Um, this, so this is joint work with uh, Nima and Kwikwi and Cheyenne over the um, And in honor of the hyperbolic workshop, um, do at least the beginning definitions with respect to a, a general convex cone, um, sort of coordinate free. Um, but then, you know, the, the main ex for the, all the main examples, the convex cone will be the non negative portion. So if you want to, you can just stick with the non negative portion. Um, so let's take K okay, uh, to be a, a convex pointed cone. Um, and we'll take a polynomial with real coefficients and n variables. Um, and uh, one of the properties, so before we go to complete log concavity, we'll start with log concavity, which already appeared. So we'll say that f, um, uh, f is log concave. I'll often abbreviate LC on this cone. Uh, if F is positive on the relative interior of the cone, um, meaning that we can take, it makes sense to take the log, evaluate the log of F. Um, and if uh, log of F is concave, um, on, on this sort of relative interior, uh, but which I really want to mean that the, the Hessian evaluated at any point on the relative interior is uh, negative semi-definite. So Hessian uh, log of f evaluated at any point um, in the relative interior of the cone is negative semi-definite. So the example to have in mind is non-negative orthant. Um, so this is some property, which you know, maybe some polynomials have. Um, and we'll say that it's completely log concave if not only the polynomial has this property, but all of its uh, directional derivatives have this property where I'm allowed to take um, directions coming from my cone. <coughs> um, so I'll say that F is completely log concave. Let's say C on K. Um, if for all vectors, I shouldn't use k. Okay. Take any m vectors um, say in the relative interior of my cone, um, then the and I take directional derivatives with respect to all of those vectors. Um, the resulting polynomial is either identically zero. Uh, or log concave. Uh, on K. Um, so here, by this notation, D sub V, I really mean the directional derivative. So sum So as a quick example, so the, the 
The quickest uh, way to get an example of such a thing is to take a univariate real rooted polynomial, all of whose roots are negative. Uh, I claim, so Ri uh, should be non negative real numbers. I claim that this is such a polynomial. So they do, in fact, exist. Um, and if I have such a polynomial, so if I want to check if it's log concave, I take its log, uh, and I take two derivatives. Um, and if you imagine taking the log of this, it turns into a sum. I'm taking you know, one derivative, I get a bunch of reciprocals. I take two derivatives, I end up with uh, a sum plus one to d of something that's non-negative. Oh, sorry, non is a minus, sorry, it's negative. Uh, negative on the, on the positive ordinal, always. Um, and so this is, so the, the function log is concave on the positive ordinal. Um, uh, and moreover, if I take, I start with any polynomial that's real rooted with negative roots, and I take a derivative of it, uh, the derivative will have the same property. Um, derivatives of real rooted polynomials are real rooted, um, and the, the roots really have to uh, interlace. Um, so this will, so the derivative of f will have the same property which means that it will be log concave. Um, and as one, uh, one might expect, um, as we've seen so far, if I have a hyperbolic polynomial, so f is hyperbolic with respect to some vector e, um, uh, then we've already seen that f is log concave on its hyperbolicity cone. And the steel Levant's notation, which was originally a notation for the hyperbolicity cone. Um, so the, the log of a hyperbolic polynomial forms a, a nice barrier function for its cone, uh, for the hyperbolicity cone. And so in particular, its log is a, forms a concave function on this cone. Um, and moreover, if I start taking directional derivative, if I take um, some, some vector in the hyperbolicity cone and its directional derivative is, is again hyperbolic with respect to the same vector. Um, and the, the corresponding cone gets bigger. Um, and hyperbolicity cone of the derivative contains the hyperbolicity cone uh, of the original. So in particular, since this polynomial is long concave on its own uh, hyperbolicity cone, it's uh, long concave on the smaller hyperbolicity cone. Yeah. yeah. Maybe too early for this question. Uh -huh. But the definition also makes sense for functions, not just for polynomials. Uh, yes. You're welcome to use this definition for functions, and I will. I don't think I'll be able to tell you any theorems <laughs> resulting uh, for that. But yeah, it would be interesting to. Just, yeah, I've, all of this makes sense for functions. Um, uh, and so, if you take, if you keep taking directional derivatives, then we'll find that. That f is completely concave on its hyperbolicity cone. Um, in particular, uh, in the special case where our cone uh, is the non negative orthant, this really cor corresponds to stability. Um, so f, let's see if we have f is say a homogeneous polynomial of degree d and n variables, um, then f is hyperbolic um, with respect to vectors in the positive orthant. Uh, if and only if it is stable. Uh, 
um, uh, which will then imply that f is well, okay. F is completely log concave on the non-negative orthon. Um, just for a very explicit example of this happening, if we take F to be the product of just the variables, it's a beautiful stable polynomial. Um, and by taking, for example, directional derivatives with respect to the all ones vector, um, we start getting elementary symmetric polynomials. <coughs> so this is stable, hyperbolic with respect to the positive orthant. That's an easy proof for you to do. Um, and if I start taking directional derivatives, I get elementary symmetric polynomials. Constant multiple of um, and the hyperbolicity cones get bigger. So the hyperbolicity cone of the first polynomial is just the non negative orthant, which I will slice and, and draw here. And then if I take a derivative, then the hyperbolicity cones grow. Um, and so the main, I think the main takeaway for this conference uh, at least is that this, whatever this condition is, it is a, a generalization of hyperbolicity for polynomials. Um, and it turns out to be, satisfy a lot of the same properties um, and have nice applications of which Nima mentioned several. Um, and as we'll see, the, it doesn't fill up, or stable polynomials do not fill up the set of all completely log concave elements. So this is really <coughs> some bigger, some bigger condition. Any questions? So for now, I want to restrict back to when the cone is the non-negative orphan. Um, and make some relatively basic uh, observations about what this implies. Um, so if we think about log concavity on this cone, uh, I claim that it's preserved under some fairly simple operations. Uh, for example, I can scale all of the variables, and I can scale the polynomial uh, by positive scalars. U and I are positive scalars. And it's really just uh, that the non-negative orthant is closed under these things. Um, we can, it turns out to be a closed set uh, in the real vector space. Let's say it's in the cone of polynomials of some degree with non-negative coefficients. Um, and using these two relatively simple properties, we can actually uh, take initial forms. So if I have some polynomial, so I'll write out in the monomial basis. Um, and it's log concave on the non-negative orthant, then so is its initial form. Uh, by which I mean, I'm going to, I have some, some weight vector w. Um, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick out all of the monomials 
that sort of maximize that weight vector. Um, and the, the reason I can do this is I can really view this as a limit of polynomials. So I can view this, um, if I have some weight vector of a polynomial, I can imagine taking my polynomial and multiplying it by, you know, t to the w1 x1, t to the w xn. This equality is not true yet. Um, for some parameter t. Uh, and what that does is it will scale the, the monomial x to the alpha by t to the w transpose alpha. Um, and then if I sort of divide through by the highest power of t that I find, t to the appropriate, I shouldn't use d, p to the degree in w of this polynomial, um, and take the limit as t gets really big, then I'm going to pick out exactly the initial form. Um, and so this, is, let's, uh, this lets us start to understand um, something uh, about what type of polynomials they are, these are, um, and in particular what their supports and what their Newton polytopes <coughs> can look like. Um, you have the Newton polytope. Uh, of, a poly of, a, of a polynomial, it's really you take all of the exponent vectors that appear, plot them as vectors in uh, R to the n, and take the convex hull. And what taking an initial form does uh, is pick off a, a face of that polytope that maximizes the linear function given by W. Um, just an example. Suppose we took the second elementary symmetric polynomial in four variables. really just the sum of xi, xj, uh, where ij range over all subsets of size 2 of 1 through 4. Um, then the Newton polytope will be uh, a polytope in R4, um, but it will live in the, the hyperplane given by all the coordinate sums equal to. And we'll actually get an octahedron. Uh, namely, the convex hull of all 0, 1 vectors with exactly two ones. And then the rest of them. If there's six, you get an octahedron. Um, and if we picked up, if we pick off, we can pick off faces of this using weight vectors. For example, if we take. 1, 0, 0, 0, that says we'll pick out all of the things with the highest degree in x1 from this polynomial. And that's just going to be all of the terms with an x1, right? So I'll get x1 times x2 plus x3 plus x1. If I pick, and that is really, I'm taking, let's do a different color. This defines a, a function on this on this polytope, and I'm picking off the face. This correspond these monomials uh, correspond to the face of the polytope that gets maximized by this function. Similarly, I can pick off an edge if I take, for example, zero, then the initial form. Then, you know, I really want to take x1, and then I want to sort of, I'm interested in x2 and x3 in equal measures. I'm not that interested in x4. So then I get just two terms. And that's maximized, because that linear function maximizes some edge on the Newton polytope. Um, and so in particular, what this means that we can take 
uh, initial forms and preserve this property of being law and concave on the non-negative orthant um, means that these much tinier polynomials um, also must be log concave. Um, and so, for example, if we want to characterize what faces, we can understand, you know, maybe what polytopes show up as Newton polytopes of log concave polynomials by understanding smaller ones, by understanding faces. Um, and in particular, it turns out to be very useful to try and understand the edges that show up in such a Newton polytope. Um, and so, for example, something I encourage you to sit down and, and try and show is that if you have a, a polynomial with just two terms, say positive coefficients, um, then this polynomial uh, is completely log concave. Uh, on the non, whenever I don't write a cone, it'll, the cone is the non-negative orthon. Um, uh, if and only if these monomials only differ by a little bit. So if and only if the, the, difference, um, the difference in the exponent vectors belongs to is either um, a uh, plus minus one zero vector with exactly one non-zero entry um, or EI has the form EI minus EJ where, where IJ Um, and in fact, if you start with exactly the type of polynomials that Nima was using, so if we start with uh, a polynomial that's multi-affine and homogeneous, so I'll sum over all subsets, let's say one through n, of some size d, and this product xi s. And the Newton polytope of this is a 0, 1, vector. It's exactly the indicator. It's the convex hull of the indicator functions, uh, indicator vectors of s, where c sub s is non-zero. Um, so this is completely log concave, non-negative orthant. Um, <coughs> then all edges of the Newton polytope Uh, are parallel to E i minus E j. Uh, for some um, because if we take the initial form, uh, if we pick out an edge using a, a weight vector, we're going to get a polynomial of this form. If it's homogeneous, then um, you're really going between sets of the same size, so the only thing you can do is swap two elements. Um, for example, here, if we look at any of these edges, um, there are always edges between, so these are the indicator vectors of all subsets of size two of one through four. Um, and if I look at the actual edges, um, subsets corresponding to two edges, they come from doing flipping exactly two elements. For example, I don't have an edge between uh, the top vertex, one, one, uh, one, two, zero, sorry, that corresponds to the subset one, two, and the bottom vertex that corresponds to the subset three, four. And I'm not allowed to, because I have to swap two elements. I have to swap out, take away two elements, and add two elements to, to get to them. Um, and in particular, using um, one, one of the many beautiful characterizations of matroids, um, this implies that the support of F, um, which is the set of subsets with non-zero coefficients, uh, these are the bases of a matroid. Um, so this, Lylon, yeah. 
is a class of log concave uh, multi-affine polynomials triple larger than the case of uh, the class of uh, stable multi-affine polynomials. Yes. Okay. And we'll get and okay. wait five minutes. Two minutes. Um, <laughs> yeah. So this is. Yeah, so so far this story look, should look very familiar from the, for people who know about stable polynomials, this is, um, this is very familiar. This was just using uh, a theorem by, uh, oh, I didn't write down the names. One of the G's is Gelfon, McPherson, and Serganova. I'm forgetting the other G's. Um, that you can tell if you're a matroid, if someone gives you a bunch of zero, one vectors and you want to know if they're the indicator vectors of some matroid, what you can do is you can take the convex hull um, and check, and if every edge is, is parallel to EI minus EJ, then you started off with a matroid. Um, and vice versa. It's really a characterization of matroids. Um, and so in particular for uh, for real stability, this was already known. This was um, done by uh, Choi, Oxley, Sokol, and Wagner around 2004. Was that if you have if this polynomial is real stable, uh, then the support of the polynomial are the bases of a matroid. Um, and one of the slightly sad things that is true is that not all matroids show up this way. Um, uh, not sorry for the stable version. So for stability. Was, um, <coughs> um, uh, and sadly, not all matroids. <coughs> all matroids come as the support or the support of a stable polynomial, of a real stable polynomial. Um, for example, uh, Pater Rendon showed that the Fano matroid uh, is an example where it's a perfectly good, perfectly good matroid, but there is no real stable polynomial whose support matches the Fano matroid. Um, uh, and more generally, so this was for homogeneous um, multi-affine polynomials. Um, again, work of, uh, of Pater sort of characterized more general combinatorics going on uh, for, for stable polynomials that are not necessarily multi-affine. Um, and for the corresponding statement of, um, for, for these polynomials, I want to define a particular type of polyhedron. So I'll take... I'll say a P is a, is a generalized permutahedron. Um, uh, if all of its edges are parallel to either plus or minus um, EI or EI. Um, and so the main, so here's one of the, the terms we can say about completely log concave polynomials, um, sort of extending, extending this idea is that if you have some polynomial, um, and it is completely log concave on the non-negative orthant, um, so then it's Newton polytope. Uh, is a generalized permutahedron. Um, and the support is really every integer vector in this polyhedron. Um, moreover, and this is where there's sort of a, you, there's a large gain over the, the theory of real stable polynomials. Um, any integer generalized permutahedron has a real stable polynomial. Um, so moreover, uh, for 
any generalized with in we need integer integer vertices. Um, the following polynomial. So I sum over all integer points. over all integer points and scale according, um, so I sum up all of the monomials uh, in my polytope scaled appropriately by the dividing by the product of the factorials, sort of multinomial coefficient. Uh, this is completely log concave on the non-negative one. Um, in particular, if I take any matroid, um, it gives me a perfectly good, it gives me a perfectly good generalized permutahedron. Um, and for a zero one factor, I really get um, the generating polynomial of, of a matroid. So for example, the, fan, the generating polynomial of the Fano matroid um, is completely log concave on the non-negative orthend, but it is not real stable. For example, all of the approximations that, approximation algorithms that one wants to run um, on, uh, for problems on matroids. Um, I think previously there was a lot of work in the case where the matroids, uh, where especially the generating polynomial uh, of the matroid was real stable, but then it runs into this problem that, you know, you, you don't get all of, all matroids this way. Um, and so one of the, sort of strengths of this class of polynomials is that one can do a lot of the same things, run a lot of the same approximation algorithms that worked uh, for real stable polynomials, but it includes uh, sort of, for example, all, all matroids. You get sort of a nice combinatorial, a, a class of polynomials that plays nice with the combinatorics that you want. It's the support of a completely log on cable. Um, one of the other sort of nice things. Uh, that has occurred with this class of polynomials is that you can actually, it's not that bad to actually test if you have one. So we just saw James uh, told us on Monday that, no, two, some day ago, that, uh, that it's actually, and be hard Tuesday, <laughs> to, um, to, to test hyperbolicity. Um, and, and I think that is bared out by you know, many of our experiences in practice where you have some polynomial and you want to know if it's hyperbolic, it's not always so easy in practice to do either. Um, and so one benefit of these is it's actually, you can actually test um, if they are. So for example, suppose you're handed um, some polynomial with non-negative coefficients um, that's homogeneous of degree D. Um, <coughs> And sort of the following things are equivalent. Um, one is that f is uh, 
completely log concave on the non-negative orbit. So that's the condition that we want. Um, two, which I'll put in, is um, f is Lorentzian. Let's say c uh, in Taylor's talk on Friday. Um, and the, the last of these three is the one that is the checkable. Uh, uh, I could make this list longer, but um, uh, one, one sort of what I consider friendly, um, friendly condition is that one, the, we should have the, the support should be correct. So we should have the Newton polytope of F should be a generalized permutahedron. Um, the support really should be, its support should fill up, should be all of the integer points in it. So there's some condition on the support. Um, and then the last thing, sort of the more relevant one, uh, is that the, you see, oh, well, okay. Mirko says it's okay, and he's in the back, so we'll we'll go ahead. Um, is that if you take derivatives in um, uh, in coordinate directions until you get a polynomial that's homogeneous of degree two, um, this is stable. Um, uh, for all, so, I ha so for all, um, so all vectors uh, of size d minus. Um, and really, by this, I mean. So the alpha I'm using is shorthand for. You know, take the derivative with respect to x1 alpha 1 times and derivative with respect to x1 alpha n times. Um, and so really what this says is that are you, there's some condition on the support. Uh, and this can be phrased in several different ways. Um, and then what you need to do is you need to take some finite, some, you know, big but finite number uh, of quadratics that you get by taking derivatives of your, various derivatives of your polynomial and check if they're stable. And for quadratic polynomials, that's easy. So we saw for cubics of, in five to 43 variables, it's hard. Um, but for quadratics, this really just means that the, that this means that the defining quadratic form Um, is exactly one positive eigenvalue. Or rather, it has the, the Lorentzian signature, plus, one plus, um, and then the rest minuses and zeros. necessary. Um, you can replace them with other things, <laughs> but you cannot, uh, you cannot get rid of them altogether. Um, for example, if you had, um, so this is, this is really just getting down to quadratics, right? So this is, so for example, if I had, um, 
Here's a nice cubic polynomial. Um, Multi-outline. Beautiful, beautiful polynomial. And if I took, so what, if I ignored this and I said, uh, how should I check if it's completely log concave? This says, uh, I am allowed to take, uh, I have to take all derivatives to get down to a quadratic. So here that would mean taking the derivative with respect to every variable um, and check if those quadratics um, are, are stable. Uh, and that condition is satisfied, right? If I take, for example, the, um, the derivative, so this is f, if I take the derivative with respect to x1 of f, I just get x2, x3, perfectly good stable polynomial. And similarly, if I take the derivative with respect to any of the others, I just get a product of two variables, which is a perfectly good um, stable polynomial. Have you count the zeros in here? I mean, this is really, the Hessian is in six variables, right? The Hessian is in six variables. So you don't, the zeros are... There's a lot of zeros. They're positive or negative, I guess, or you don't care. So the Hessian of... So this will give a rank two Hessian. F will just have a one in the two three spot and the three two spot and a zero everywhere else. So it'll be a rank. The eigenvalues are minus one, one, and, and zero. Right. So yeah. Which so is good. That's, that's good. This is good. I see. Okay. <coughs> I see. Okay. Yeah, it passes this test. You want strictly positive eigenvalues. I want one strictly positive eigenvalue. Um, I, I want this polynomial to be stable. That's, if you like stable polynomials, that's the, that's the condition. I want this polynomial to be stable. Um, and this is a perfectly good stable polynomial. So it passes, uh, it passes this test, um, but it does not pass the support test. Um, and this is good because this is not the, So th this polynomial is not log concave on the on the non-negative board. Um, really it's, um, it's, and it's also not the support of a matroid. Right? It's Newton polytope is is very much not what we not what we want. So this is this is uh, this part is necessary. There's lots of different ways to get to it. Um, so Peter and Junha have sort of independently developed. Um, this class of polynomials, and they get to basically the same condition via a different route, but you need something. Um, you need something is not really long. Sorry. If the quadratic form you get is uh, not singular, mm -hmm. then it's enough to require that it's just cancel it. Um, so if you have, if you know your, uh, is that true? Uh, so. If I wanted to prove that, I think I would try and prove that means that you have enough support. I'm not signature. Uh, I don't think it's this quite full, but it might be sort of big enough. Um, like you could chop off the diagonal. You can always chop off the x i to the d. <coughs> I still get the right signature. I think it is probably not. If it's enough, because it, it, it implies all this other stuff. That's what I would say. Um, so you're Cynthia? Yeah. Time. Time. Good. Um, <coughs> yep. OK. Uh, I have two, I think I have two, two minutes. It's dangerous to have you chair because we know that you just, you know, 
<laughs> you taught us to just power through. Um, so, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, um, so one of the so maybe I'll just go for ideas of uh, whatever has left. So one of the ideas of uh, a lot of these equivalences is you can really reduce um, you can reduce this. Um, fairly hard-looking condition of log concavity with respect to taking, you know, all directional derivatives on all of the cone. Um, uh, with some additional condition, you can really um, you can really get away with taking directional derivatives with respect to like the extreme rays of this cone. For example, the non-negative orthent, um, you can really get away with taking. You know, this is directional derivatives with respect to the extreme <coughs> rays uh, of this cone. Um, and well uh, and just to so that it's written down at least once um, really the connection between um, this log concavity and the this signature property um, is really if you take the hessian of the log it turns out to be this. We ignore the f squared in the denominator. This is, and we evaluate at a point, we get a constant times a matrix minus a rank one vector. And we want this to be negative semi-definite when evaluated at all points of the non-negative orthant. And what this is going to mean is this means that this matrix as a quadratic form will have to be negative semi-definite um, on the orthogonal complement of this vector. Negative semi-definite. All of this evaluated at some point on um, on a hyperplane um, given by this polynomial, and that will imply for that it has uh, has this sort of miraculous thing is that one can go back. Um, yes. So this seems to be a nice set of polynomials. There's still you know, some some properties of hyperbolicity extend very nicely. Some it is unclear how to extend them very nicely, or if they do. Um, and uh, among other things, they include a lot of nice combinatorial examples, like the, gen the basis generating polynomial of the matrix. Let's stop. Uh, I would like to ask a question about these statements of type uh, polynomial, homogeneous polynomial P is completely log concave mm -hmm. on convex concave. Uh -huh. So for fixed concave, you showed us that there are completely, uh, completely uh, uh, logarithmically concave uh, polynomials that are uh, not necessarily stable or hyperbolic. Mm -hmm. So now I would like to focus on the convex cones that you get is the domains. Mm -hmm. So all the examples that I was able to keep track, they happen to be hyperbolistic ones. Um, so are there examples of uh, are there examples of completely low concave homogeneous polynomials who are so on a convex cone that's not a hyperbolistic cone? I mean one could always take a subset of a cone. Right. Like I could take my favorite non-hyperbolicity cone and stick it into the non-negative orthant. Right. But it's not a natural domain in the sense that it's when you take the log, yeah. Uh, um, I mean, I'm thinking in terms of optimization, right? Sort of, it's not really true that if you can optimize over a convex, some, some you know, uh, optimization problem or this class of convex cones, it's not necessarily true that you could optimize over every subset of that cone. Yeah, yeah. I, well... Uh, so one thing that we don't know is uh, what, um, how to enlarge once you have a cone. So if you have a hyperbolic polynomial, and it's hyperbolic with respect to a point, right? Just a measly old point. Then it turns out you get a beautiful convex cone, and it's hyperbolic with respect to any point in the cone, right? And it's unique. You get a cone. Um, and uh, for these polynomials, you know, you start with some cone, 
uh, and it's completely log concave with respect to that cone, for example, the non-negative orthend, and it's very tempting to try and enlarge it. And I think it's <coughs> unclear what the correct way to do that is. So I think that um, it, it, that part of the story is not finished. It's not clear if maybe Peter's finished it. Um, yeah, so, if, so to answer the question, so you can, so if you have this definition, then you can, of course, look at maximal cones with this property. And for hyperbolic polynomials, this will be unique and will be the hyperbolicity cone. Are there like finitely many maximal cones? But for Lorentz, well, for, for completely low concave Lorentzian polynomials, this maximal cone is not unique. How badly non unique, though? So, very, think, badly yeah, non -unique. very badly non unique. So There's a continuum what? of maximal. Well, cool. there might be some other definition of the right there cone, but, definition. you know. So, so that's the, you know, so far. I think what you want to ask is, what's the hyperbolicity cone? And so far, there might not be a hyperbolicity cone. That's what seems to be happening. We don't know of a good set to optimize, a good <coughs> convex cone to optimize well, okay, so over. I mean, to make it sharper. I mean, the thing is, there's a natural domain where the polynomial is positive. So sure. when you write log p of something, right? So uh, that does define a cone just, just because of the logarithm that you're applying. Uh, so that's not necessarily convex, right? So when it is convex, is it always hyperbolic? Uh, no. When it's convex, I, I don't know of an example offhand, but I would be very surprised. Maybe a writer on his laptop has examples. Um, but yeah, so far I think the cone is, anyway, the cone is a mystery. I have a question on the support condition. Mm -hmm. So is there a theorem of the following kind? Suppose I take the interior coefficients and I make them more positive when I stay CLC. Some version of the state. Um, I find that plausible. I cannot give you a theorem. The question, so the question was, the pat question was. The interior lattice points have to be in the support. Yeah. I'd like to have a statement that says, suppose I take these interior coefficients and I somehow make them even larger and I stay CLC. Um, of course, we can do that. Yeah, but if you scale them by any positive number, right? You can't just, I don't, I don't think you can do it willy nilly, um, but uh, I think that there, it's, I find it very plausible that there's a careful way to. Um, so, that, so maybe the thing that uh, Baron does is sort of implicitly referring to is that um, this condition, you do get some sort of nice discrete or almost discrete concavity conditions on the coefficients. Um, and it's very plausible that if you somehow make them more discreetly log concave that you stay in this set. I think you would need to do it carefully. Um, and, uh, but I don't have... I, no statement. No. I don't personally have a statement of that one. Um, yeah, but I, I find it plausible. What can you say about the zero set of uh, of a local cone? I asked to the I asked to the audience. <laughs> what can you say about the uh, the zero set of a completely <coughs> log concave polynomial? I think in general, not much. I think it. You know, there. Yeah, Dan. Well, I mean, there was a session here earlier in the program and. The conclusion was that, for instance, for so for plane curves of low degree, the topology can be anything. Oh, really? Oh. So just for people in uh, the corner. No, it's theorem, really, but it's a theorem. It's a theorem? No, no, it's not a theorem. What, what degree? Six? Four, five, six. Four, five, six. Okay, so plane curves, polynomials in three, homogeneous polynomials, three variables, degree four, five, six, the real zero set can have any topology you like. Three also. Sure, okay. Not, <laughs> Not two, Not but, Not. yeah, um, yeah. Well, it's uh, quadratics that you get by differentiating. Um, do they have a common interlace set of a linear form or no? Um, I don't think they necessarily all have to have a common interlacer, but, um, but you get to them by common interlacing. Um, so, so in the, if you have quadratics, yeah, so if you, you can, you can basically 
go from this condition to something like this by using something like common interlacers. Um, and really, the I think that the, the well, OK, we'll put us so one potential definition of interlacing, um, uh, is, you know, maybe we want G to interlace. We'll put quotes because it's not actual interlacing because the topology is, you know, who knows what interlaces. Uh, F um, is really that when you take enough derivatives, um, directional derivatives down to quadratics, so say you take directional derivatives, this will be a linear form. If this is, say, degree d and this is degree d minus 1, then um, the linear form you get uh, will interlace the quadratic stable polynomial. I think this is potentially a good definition of, of interlacing for all vectors in the column, in the non-negative form. Um, so far, in terms of the pictures that you want to draw, a lot of, for hyperbolic polynomials, you want to draw pictures. The pictures you want to draw, what you have to do is you have to get down to quadratics, and then you're then you have stable polynomials. You can draw pictures, um, and so I think that the Um, all the pictures that I've been able to draw have been sort of going down to, to quadratics and trying to keep track of what happens. Um, and that's, that's uh, and in particular, derivatives, derivatives will satisfy this property of interlacing. And Jim is going to stop soon. So take it offline here, and we'll start again in 15 minutes.